Isn't that a great song? You know, that, um, that comes from the Heidelberg Catechism. Um, what is our only hope in life and death? Well, it's that I belong to Jesus Christ, body, soul, and spirit. That's the good news today, that we belong to him, body, soul, and spirit. You know, I actually want to give you some good news just before I get into what we're going to talk about, because we hear so much bad news. And you might not know or remember that God is actually working in powerful ways around the world today, just in unprecedented ways. Even in the midst of COVID and everything else, God is at work. I, uh, I want to share with you something I heard this week from a pastor in Iran. You know, they're experiencing a great revival and a great outpouring of God's Spirit in Iran. Um, you don't hear it in the news, but, but thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of people are coming to Christ. And uh, they interviewed a pastor there, and he was disguised and so on and so forth. But um, among other things that he said, <clears throat> he said, you know, they're going through severe persecution. There's times when, um, you know, people show up at the house and people disappear and you don't see them again. But uh, yet the, the Holy Spirit is just opening hearts all over the place. Well, he talked about somebody he knew, um, a Muslim, didn't know Christ at all. And this Muslim friend had somebody appear at his door one night dressed in white. And uh, he came in and he said to the Muslim man, get out a notebook and write down what I'm going to tell you. So he got out a notebook and wrote it down. And this repeated for several days. I think it was actually almost a month. Uh, this man would appear, it's white, dressed in white. Uh, Take out your notebook and write down what I'm going to tell you. And he did. He was talking to his Christian friend and his Christian pastor friend said, well, show me the notebook. What did you write down? And the man opened his notebook and he said, well, I, 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 this is how it starts. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. All things were made through him. He had written down the Gospel of John. Isn't that amazing? And uh, was introduced to Jesus Christ that way. I mean, God is doing some amazing things in the world. And by the way, then this Iranian pastor looked at the camera and said to my North American brothers and sisters, please don't tell us you're being persecuted because you have to put a mask on. That was, I thought that was, that's worth knowing too. Um, anyway, God's at work, not only in Iran and around the world, but actually right here in central Alberta. And we ought to be encouraged. Um, this isn't a time to be discouraged. This is a time to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Well, we're, what we're going to do today and leading up to Easter is I want to just reflect a little bit with you on the cross of Christ. I know we know about it, we say, and we talk about it, and we celebrate the Lord's Supper, beginning of the month. But did you know that the way forward in the Christian life is back to the cross? You have to go back to the cross to go forward in the Christian life. It all begins there, but it also carries on from there every single day. So we'll reflect a bit on the cross. I just want to help you understand some of the significance of it. And then when we get to Easter, we'll, we'll talk about how the cross and the resurrection gives us hope in times of fear. Then after Easter, um, we'll try and, uh, from Ephesians chapter 1, I'd like to spell out some of the implications of the cross and resurrection. Um, and that should take us through pretty much April. And then I'll give you a break from listening to me. Um, and uh, May will have some really good people um, talk to us here. But uh, just, to, just to begin, uh, let me ask you a question by way of introduction. This is the question. What dominates your mind? What dominates your thinking? What actually fills your horizons? What is it? Is it your health or COVID or what the future might be or what it's going to be like after COVID, if there's an after COVID? Is it your family? Is it your money? What actually dominates your thinking and fills your horizons? I read a verse in the New Testament. It goes like this from Galatians. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now, the word boast, may I never boast, in older translations is glory. May I never glory in anything but the cross. The New Testament, originally written in Greek, and most, most of it's easy to translate, but when you come to the word glory or boast, there's actually no exact English equivalent. So 
boast is, or glory is kind of the best they can do. But if you dug into the word, what you would find out is that behind it's the idea of obsession. The idea of obsession. In other words, what Paul is saying, I'm obsessed by the cross of Jesus Christ. He hasn't left it behind. He hasn't just come to Christ and left it behind, and then on the first Sunday of the month, he thinks about it again. He says, it fills my mind. It dominates my thinking. It fills all of my horizons. The, I'm obsessed, he says, with the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, that's an interesting statement. In fact, one of the most extraordinary statements Paul ever made. I'm obsessed with this cross of Jesus Christ. Well, it's not only Paul. When you read the whole New Testament, it is dominated by the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood he shed there. Right from the book of Matthew through to Revelation. In Revelation, they worship the lamb who was slain and shed his blood. I mean, it, it, the New Testament is saturated with the cross of Jesus Christ. The preaching of the early teachers and preachers of that early church, it, they preached Christ crucified. I mean, you, you can't get away from it. In fact, it was what he wanted to be remembered by, his death, that just um, dominated Jesus' mind. He wanted to be remembered by his death more than anything else. If you and I were trying to come up with something to remember Jesus by, it might not have been a cross, it might have been a cradle. We might have been, I mean, I mean we wanted, maybe we wanted to remember that the, this great incarnation took place where the word became flesh. Or maybe we would have chosen a towel. He came to serve, to humble himself and to serve. Maybe it'd be a boat and we remember all the, you know, the teaching that took place from the boat. But for Jesus, it was the cross that he wanted to be remembered by more than anything else. You don't understand Christ unless you understand his cross. But that was a major stumbling block in his world. See, they... The idea of a crucified Messiah, that was an oxymoron, sort of like saying dry water, uh, um, you know, crucified Messiah. Crucified was, that's what you did to Roman criminals condemned to death. You crucified them. But Messiah was always a word in the Jewish world that meant deliverer, savior, the conqueror, the one that would overthrow the Romans and finally bring about the reign of God. So the crucified Messiah, that just didn't even make, that was ridiculous. And it was a stumbling block to Jews. And it was insane and crazy to Romans. And it's so yesterday, today, to people today. It was just a major stumbling block. Crucif Cicero actually was a Roman statesman. And he said, for Romans, crucifixion is absent from our bodies, our minds, our ears, and our eyes. Crucifixion is absent from our bodies, minds, eyes, and ears. We don't think about that. So to try and take the gospel into Rome was a tough go. And so Paul write it. That's why he read at the beginning of Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of this crucified Messiah because I know that in that crucified Messiah is the power of God that can change any life. Iran, Red Deer, Central Alberta, wherever that, that life is. So by way of introduction, I just, I just want to give a few introductory thoughts and then just um, touch on an Old Testament scripture behind the cross. And it's a bit like you're trying to draw a few threads together today for you just to set the table. But um, why was Paul obsessed with the cross? That'd be a good question. Now, why, why was it the cross that dominated his thinking? What was it about the cross? I think there are two answers you could give to that. One is Paul would say, we boast in the cross. Because that's our acceptance with God. We boast in the cross because that's our acceptance with God. The question is, how can I, a lost and guilty sinner, stand before a holy God? How can I, as a lost and guilty sinner, ever stand before a holy God? We can't enter his presence in the tattered rags of our own morality. Self-salvation is an impossibility. Our only hope, Paul would say, is in the cross of Christ. You cannot be right with God apart from the cross of Christ. That's what Paul would say. You know, in the world we find ourselves in today, a year into COVID, we're all asking questions about what's going on in the world. 
What's the government doing? What's behind all this? What are the health people thinking? What's next? Uh, where's it all headed? Will there be a new normal again as we knew it? You know, could I suggest to you that those aren't the best questions to ask? You know, the best question to ask is, what is God actually up to in our world? That's the best question. What is God actually up to in our world today? Do you remember when we, when we um, looked at the this 23rd Psalm, we, we noticed that it says the Lord at the beginning, and the Lord was I am, his great name I am. And I am means I am actively present. He's nothing other than, well, he is, but he, 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 you would have to say he's, he's always actively present. He's actively present in Red Deer. He's actively present in Central Alberta. He's actively present in our world. So what is he up to? That's the question. What's God up to? I would, I would suggest this, among other things, but I'll just say this for now. Is he not showing the world? Is he not showing us that we can't save ourselves? Isn't he showing us that we can't save ourselves? I mean, is he not shaking everything that can be shaken? And will he not continue to do that until only that which cannot be shaken is left? I think that's what he's up to. See, We've put our hope in science and technology to save us, but it can't. The pandemic, we think we can get under control, and then there's a variant here and there. It's like that game at the fair where the gophers keep popping up, and you, you keep trying to nail them, and you can't. And it may be impossible to contain this pandemic or any others in our world because of our mobility through air and the globalization of our economies all due to modern technology, and then throw in climate change and the never-ending threat of international terrorism, both heightened by scientific advances, the very things that were supposed to save us from such terrible perils have actually created new ones. I think what God is doing is he's preparing the world for the gospel. That's what he's doing. He's preparing the world to hear the gospel. There's only one kingdom that's unshakable, and it's his kingdom. We'll talk about that in June and probably the early part of July. Here's, here's, here's the deal. Are you ready? Are you ready to share the good news? Because God is preparing the world to hear it. Are you and I ready to share it? Because you know what? It'll be like it is in the book of Acts when God comes again in power. He's not going to send angels. He's going to empower his own people to share the good news. The question is, are we ready? Are we ready? Are we prepared to give a reason for the hope that's in us? That, I think, is why just a few reflections around the cross are important so we get it straight again, so we can give a reason for the hope that we have in an age of fear. So why was Paul obsessed with the cross? Well, it was the the only way of acceptance with God. Good wasn't good enough. There was nobody righteous, not even one person. And so there had to be another way of salvation, and God provided it through the cross of Jesus. Now, here's the second reason he let it dominate his thinking. He, he boasted in the cross for, for his daily discipleship depended on it. His daily followership of Jesus depended on the cross. I don't know if you noticed, but in that verse, there's not... There's one cross, but three crucifixions. There's the cross, Jesus died on it. But then Paul says, through that cross, the world is crucified for me. And then he says, and I'm crucified to the world. So you have one cross with three crucifixions going on there. And it reminds us of something Jesus said to his disciples, that if we're going to come after him, we've got to be willing to take up our cross daily and follow him. If you in that world saw a man carrying a cross, you knew he was condemned to die. Christian discipleship, Christian followership of Jesus, it's not just about trying to be good and do good. It's, it's, it's actually, um, it involves a change and a transformation so radical that no imagery can do it justice except this idea of dying and being resurrected, dying to an old life 
being resurrected to a new life marked by two things in particular, holiness or godliness. And that word godliness is your character shaped by God's truth. Godliness, holiness, and love. So it's dying to an old life, rising again to a new life. Many Christians are familiar with the basics of Christianity and Christ crucified. But the more we understand it, the more we'll delight in God's amazing grace. Did you know the cross was in God's heart before he ever created the world? He talks about Jesus as the lamb slain before the foundations of the world were ever laid. It's the turning point of history. It's the climax of scripture. It's the very heart and soul of our faith. And it will be our deepest joy for eternity. And you can actually read sometime Revelation 5, and they're already in heaven. The stage is already being set. The worship has already begun. The worship, the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth. So that's why I think it's important that we talk a little bit about the cross, and especially as we move into Easter. And I hope in the next few weeks we'll become more and more obsessed, as Paul was. The cross will more and more dominate our thinking as it did for Paul. And I guess the place to start when you're thinking about the cross is the Old Testament. I think that's the place to start. Because if we, if we get the, um, the Old Testament um, overtures and prefigurements of the cross, it'll keep us from interpreting that story any way that we like. The, the Old Testament becomes like the tracks that we run on or the riverbanks that lead right to the cross so that we understand it fully. So I, I was reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 th these words, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. What's that talking about? Well, he's, he's drawing a line from the cross all the way back to Exodus 12, where you had this event called the Passover. And, and he's saying that there's a dot that needs to be joined from the Passover in Exodus 12 to what happened when Jesus died on the cross. And so I'd like to take you there. And I, I can't get into it in, in a lot of depth, but I can at least read it to you and ha have you note a few highlights, and then we'll try and see how that, that shines a light on the cross. It, the story goes like this. It, um, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You're to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you, you may take them from the sheep or the, or the goats, take care of them until the 14th day of the month, and when all the members of the community of Israel then must slaughter them at twilight. Then they're to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops and door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That, that same night, they're to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread with, made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Don't leave any of it till morning. If some of it's left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you're to eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I'll pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Well, that's, um, that's the story, at least the beginning of the story of the Passover in Exodus 12. Just to uh, help you with the background to it, a long time before that ever occurred, God had said to one man, Abraham, I'm going to give you many, many descendants, so many that they won't even be able to be counted. Now, by the time we read in Exodus 12 about this Passover deal, Abraham had been given many descendants. They become a, a, a large people. I don't know how many. It, it ranges in from 600,000 to 2 million, but a lot of people all living in Egypt. 
they become slaves in Egypt to Pharaoh. Their life had become very, very bitter. And they cried out to God. And then it says that God remembered them when he heard their cry. That doesn't just mean he, they, they came to his mind. When you read in the Bible that God remembers, it means it comes to mind, but then it moves him to do something about it. So when God heard them, it moved him to do something about it. What he did was he sent nine plagues to this point on Egypt, on Pharaoh, to convince Pharaoh to let the Israelites go because he didn't want to let them go. So these plagues ranged from things like frogs and gnats and boils and darkness and hail and uh, death of the livestock and uh, water turned to blood, all these kind of things God did. But it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Isn't that interesting? He wouldn't let the people go. Now, just as a sidebar to that, I think it's Romans 9, maybe it's Romans 11 in the New Testament. I think it's Romans 9. It says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So you have two statements. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Which is it? The answer is both. Here's the deal. Pharaoh hardened his heart, and God said yes to that. Now, that's very important. When God speaks to your heart, and you know you're convicted about something, don't harden your heart. You don't want him to say yes to that. You don't want him to say, okay, have it your way. That's what happened to Pharaoh. And so all nine of these plagues had um, come and gone. Pharaoh hardened his heart, but God said, I'm going to send a tenth plague. And this time I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to put to death all the firstborn in the land. Animals, people, I'm going to put them to death. And uh, that's, the, that's right at the point where you come to Exodus chapter 12. The Exodus, this Old T Testament story of the people coming out of Egypt, to find God's relationship with his people more than any other. Uh, the long, um, that, that long journey out of Egypt to the promised land was there. They always look back on that as the, the greatest deliverance that they'd ever experienced. So what God is going to do here on that night is made clear in Exodus 12. And I'll just, let me touch on a couple of high points. There's so much here, but just a couple because we don't have that much time. But the, the story kind of unfolds. This Passover story unfolds in stages. And I suppose the first stage would be this, that, that God reveals himself as a judge, as a judge. He's going to deal with sin. He's going to deal with evil. He's going to deal with Pharaoh. He's going to deal with people that have hardened their hearts. And he's going to go through Egypt, God himself, and put to death the firstborn in the land. Um, from Pharaoh's palace down, it says, right to the slave girl, um, everybody. Nobody's going to be exempt from this. And there would only be one way of escape. And that would, by, that would be by um, uh, availing yourself of the provision that God makes. That whole idea is important. That idea of God as judge. We like to think of his mercy, his grace, his unfailing love. You know, you know what I love, I thank him a lot for, because I need it, is that attribute in Timothy where, where Timothy praises God for his unlimited patience. Aren't you glad that God's got unlimited patience? I am. If it wasn't for his unlimited patience, I'd have been long gone. Um, but we don't talk about his judgment, but he's just. And as a just God, he judges sin. There's a place where it says in the Bible, the person that sins dies. And you can, that can only go on for so long before the judge has to step in. That's happening here. And before you ever get good news in the Bible, you need bad news. You know, good news isn't really good news until you've understood the bad news that we're all sinners. God judges sin, but he's made a way of escape. And that's the second part of this story of the Passover that unfolds. It's the provision of a substitute. The provision of a substitute. God said to the Israelites, now listen, take a lamb, and this is an important point, without defect. Without defect. In other words, perfect. Only what's perfect is acceptable to God. That's why when you come to the book of Malachi at the end of the Old Testament, God, God goes after his people because they were bringing their offerings to the church. They were worshiping, offering worship. But their heart wasn't in, in it. 
And it, so it wasn't acceptable to God. If you're not a cheerful giver, keep your money. If you're not meaning the words that you sing, don't sing them. Because God, he, what's acceptable to God is the whole heart. That's why when Jesus came, you have to hold on to, with all your heart, we're dealing with a man who's fully God, but absolutely sinless. Because it's that perfect sacrifice that God accepts. So they had to choose a lamb. They had to kill it. They had to take the blood. And they had to put it on the side of their door frames and across the top. And they, they would do that with the blood of the lamb. And, you know, um, they would, then they would eat and have a meal with the, the meat of the lamb. And, and go, because God had said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. The sacrifice of the Passover lamb would be, a, they, they would know when they were eating that lamb that their life was spared because of a death. See, in Egypt that night, there was going to be death in every home. Not just the Egyptian homes, every home, there would be a death. It would either be the death of the firstborn or it would be the death of a substitute, a lamb. Life came from death. So if you just stop there for a minute and just think about how that sheds a bit of light on the cross, I think four things come to mind. The message would be unmistakable to the Israelites, and the hope would be for us too, that the judge and the Savior would be the same person. The judge and the Savior actually weren't two different people. They were the same person. It was the same God who passed through Egypt to judge, who passed over the Israelites to protect them. At the cross, the judge and the Savior are the same person. You can't pit the Father against the Son. It wasn't to appease an angry God that Jesus died. It was in God's heart. He so loved the world that he came up with a way to both judge sin and be a Savior. Only God could have figured that out. But that's what happened at the cross. It's, it's, it's one and the same God who through Christ saves us from himself. Then the, the second thing I think that would be crystal clear, it was salvation was only through a substitute. The firstborn um, was only spared in homes where a lamb died. And as you read the New Testament, you begin to hear overtures from the Passover quite quickly. You hear a man, for example, John the Baptist, looking at Jesus one day and saying, hey, that's the Lamb of God. That's the one that takes away the sin of the world. And as soon as he said, that's the Lamb of God, Jewish people would, would probably bring up all these, I hope they would, all these images from their past. The Lamb that was put to death. That's the Lamb of God. Those lambs, they could only, they were temporary as it were, and, and they, could only, um, they could only year after year um, cover over sins until the Lamb came. And when the lamb, Jesus, came, all sin was dealt with once and for all. But it was dealt with as a, Jesus was a substitute. He stood in our place at the cross. Like that lamb in that Israelite home stood in their place. Salvation was by substitution. Third thing I noted was the lamb's blood, it had to be sprinkled on the door frames um, after it had been killed. It wasn't enough to kill the lamb. You had to take the blood and sprinkle it. In other words, it had to be personally applied. There was individual application of the divine provision. The blood of Christ must be applied to your life by you. It does you no good to know that he died as a substitute. None at all if you don't apply it to your life. You have to apply what Jesus did on the cross to your own life. Talk about that at the end. Then the fourth line that draws to the cross for me from Passover is each family received um, or rescued rather by God. Each family rescued by God was thereby purchased for God. Their whole life now belonged to him. Their whole life belonged to him. They were his people. He rescued them from Pharaoh. They now belong to him. When Jesus died on the cross, he rescued us. And our lives now belong to him. They don't belong to us anymore. We're, we're not the owners of our life anymore. He is. He purchased us at the cross. 
you know, it was so significant that night, that Passover night, that it, it actually, in the life of Israel, marked a brand new beginning. I don't know if you picked it up in the first verse, but they were, they were to start with a brand new calendar. This night, this day will be the first night, the night of all nights. The old is gone. There, this is a new calendar. It's a new beginning. You have a new identity. You're a new nation. You know, a new name. So change the calendar to reflect that, it says. If you, if you were to summarize the Passover, these two things stand out as heart and soul of this Passover back in Egypt. It meant, it meant rescue from death, and it meant deliverance from slavery. Rescue from death and deliverance from slavery. That's what the cross means, among other things. Rescue from eternal death and freedom from slavery, not to Pharaoh, but from sin. It reminded me of first, Second Corinthians, rather, 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the new calendar, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. That's what happened at the cross. Our old life, it died. And we were given a new start, a fresh beginning. We're not who we once were. And that's important to understand because in our world, nobody else would ever understand that. We live in a world where our past is always with us. If you spend any time on the internet or social media, um, you know it can be a merciless place, a place of guilt, shame, and Twitter mobs, and your mistakes are always with you. Just go on the news tonight. You're, you know, you'll see people, and they're brought up, and this is what they did, and that's what they did, and they should resign, and you, you never get out from under that. You can't get away from your past. The problem is, we all have a past. We do. We're all sinners. I mean, none of us would want our past brought up in front of everybody else. We all have one. We're all born sinners. We're like slaves to sin. So we have a lot of train wrecks back there and things that we'd be ashamed to admit in front of anybody else. But the good news is, you can be born again. You know what that means? Born a different way. Born a different way. You can have a new beginning, a new freedom from your past. The story of the Passover helps us understand that part of the crosswork of Jesus. It's a, it, 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 it tells us we can be free from the past, but it's a different, a different, how can I put this? A, a different view of freedom than you might have thought. Let me give you this quote. I think it's a good one by Kevin DeYoung. Real freedom is not the ability to be whoever you want to be. Real freedom is the ability to be who you ought to be. See, when Jesus set us free from slavery to sin, it's not just now I can do whatever I want. No, it's now I'm free to be who I ought to be. Now I'm free to be who God created me to be. Now I'm free to live in relationship with this magnificent God that provided this incredible salvation. The Bible says we're not our own. We're bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. It's not your body. It's not your life anymore. It's his. At the cross, you've been rescued, redeemed. You've been purchased from slavery to sin. You've been set free, set free to serve God, which is the only kind of freedom worth living for. So having said that, Here's the thing. It's great that we've been forgiven. And sometimes it's not that hard to get our heads around that. Here's the real question. How do we stop sinning? We've been forgiven. How do we stop sinning? You know what the answer is? Be who you are. Be who you are. You are not who you once were. You are not that person that Jesus saved and cleansed and brought into his family. That you has gone, the old is gone and the new has come. You're no longer a slave to sin. No longer a slave to, you're a slave to God. And you have to get up in the morning and say to him, listen, I'm not who I used to be. I'm going to be who I am today. The enemy's going to say, oh, yes, you are. Your mind will say, you know what? I think you still got those same time. You got to say to yourself, no, I'm a new creation in Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come. And what that means practically is you start the day by offering your body to God. 
and saying, you bought me at great price. I'm not who I used to be. I now present it to you. It's my spiritual act of worship today. And I need you to fill me with your spirit. And when you're tempted to do something you used to do or be the old person, you need to, you need to start talking to yourself. Christians don't talk to themselves enough. Did you know that? And so we forget. You start talking to yourself and say, hey, wait a minute. I don't have to do that anymore. I was a slave to that before, but Jesus set me free. I can say no. And you, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you put it to death. You carry on. That's what it means to be who you are. To remind yourself what Jesus did. Present your body to him. And when the, when the old way of thinking and life comes up, you say no and you put it to death. And that, that's an ongoing process, but it's how Christians live. The whole, I've said this so many times before, the whole thrust of the New Testament ethics is simply be who you are. So easy to forget, isn't it? That we don't live in Egypt anymore. We're not under Pharaoh. We're under Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. So before I, before I end, I think I should say this. So just in case you need to be clear on this or somebody needs to be clear on this, how do I get in on this great salvation? How do you get in on it? How does what Jesus did on the cross become true for you so that you're rescued from eternal death and delivered from a whole old way of life? How do you get in on that? Understand this, that every other religion and philosophy in the world, it's all about how can I put it? Ascending to God, getting up to God somehow. You know, through, um, through good works or moral virtue or ritual observances or something like that, it's this idea of being acceptable to God or getting to God. But in contrast, Christianity is about salvation through a God who descended to us. Think about those people in Egypt. They had no hope. They couldn't have saved themselves. There was nothing they could have done to get out from under Pharaoh. But God in his great mercy saw them and came down to them and rescued them, brought them out with his powerful arm. This same God says to you and I, you could never change your position. You could never, self-salvation is impossible. You can't do it. But I've come down to you in my son, Jesus Christ. He became a man. Do you know that when, when Jesus became a man, the Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit, were forever changed. It was a huge deal. They were forever changed. One of them now has a human body forever. When Jesus went back into heaven, he didn't just change back to what he was before. This was a huge deal. And this God came down to us in his son, Jesus Christ, and he paid our full debt on the cross. Nothing left to pay when Jesus said it is finished. That's what he meant. It's been paid in full. And you receive this salvation as a gift. A gift. You don't earn it. You don't make promises to God that you hope to keep. You receive it as a gift. But here's the catch. This gift cannot be accepted without admitting weakness. That's the catch, as it were. That's the stumbling block today. It's pride. I have to humble myself and admit my need and my weakness. Can I give you an illustration? The only one I could think of, and it's kind of like goofy, but worked. I was probably 47, 48, and I noticed there was a change in my eyes. I couldn't read the way I used to be able to read, and I'd take my book or my Bible, and I used to be able to just, you know, nail it, and, and then I'd have to hold it out a bit like that. And then I got to the point where my arm wasn't long enough anymore. And my dear wife, who's an optician, said, guess what? You need glasses. I'm not getting glasses. I can, I can still read. Just give me the first word, you know. I didn't want to admit that I needed glasses. 
Well, the day came when she convinced me to come down to their eye place and look at glasses. I said, I'll just look. I looked at them and I have to admit when she tried a couple of pairs on me, I could kind of bring it in a little closer. I, I didn't admit it, but I, inside I admitted that. Then she found a pair of glasses for me she really liked. Not these ones, but they were very expensive. And I said, I can't afford that. Give me down to Costco. <laughs> she said, no, these are the glasses you need. I said, I can't afford them. She said, essentially, she said this. She said, look, I'll pay for them. Take them as a gift for me. When I accepted that gift, I had to admit my weakness. I had to admit I needed them. I had to admit that I wasn't what I used to be. It's the same with the cross, what Jesus did. It's a gift, but you're going to have to admit your weakness. You're going to have to admit that without Jesus Christ, I can't save myself. I can't. I'm going to have to humble myself. I have to confess my sin to him. I'm going to ask him for mercy. But the moment you can do that, God takes the blood that Jesus shed on the cross and he puts it on you. He says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. On judgment day, I'll pass over you. You're now my dear child. You're now free. Free to become who I created you to be. Free to live and walk in my presence day after day. There's no gift like that. That, I think, is where we should start when we reflect on the cross. We should always, always give God thanks every day. Remember we talked last week about giving God thanks for three things today? How about the first two being, Father, I thank you that you rescued me from death. And I thank you that you brought me out from my slavery to sin. You, you took the old and it's gone and you're, you're making a new person out of me. And Father, thank you. And that, that prepares you for the day when we'll see him face to face. And it won't be the first time then that we thanked him. We thanked him all the way along, but now we get to do it face to face. That'll be the best day of our lives. Let's stand together and pray. Father, thank you today for your great mercy. Only you could have figured out a way to to save us from slavery, to sin, and to the devil. And Lord, we messed up our lives so bad. We, we, we can blame Adam and Eve, but Father, we have to blame ourselves because we have willingly and regularly rebelled and sinned against you. And yet somehow you loved us so much that you sent the Holy Spirit to track us down and you pointed us to the cross and what Jesus did. And when we believe that, you gave us new life and a fresh start. You forgave all of our sins. And today we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.